All right, welcome tonight to White Oak Baptist Church. This is going to be an abbreviated service. We're excited about the, the uh, derby race upstairs with the kids, and so let's not waste any time. Let's stand and take our hymnals over to 376. We're going to sing the first and the fourth verse. It'll be our only song tonight, 376, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Aren't you glad that God's there for you during stormy times? Amen? Let's sing the first and the last, 376. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. Before we sing the last, turn around, greet one another. We'll come back and sing that last verse in just a moment. Let's sing that last verse. Here we go. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. You can be seated. And we're going to have Brother um, Sir Gru come up in just a moment here. Does anybody have a prayer request slip they filled out and are ready to turn in? If so, if you hold that, that up. And then uh, Brother Mike will come collect those. And uh, we're, everything tonight will be abbreviated. Brother uh, John's going to come up a mo moment and pray for us. And he'll, um, he'll be the only one praying tonight. So, uh, Brother John, you come up at this time and, and lead us in prayer. Okay, good evening. Okay, those who do want to come up, uh, the men who want to join us uh, up here, uh, you're certainly welcome to. Uh, I'm just going to touch on a few of these uh, prayer requests. Uh, Amanda, Amanda, um, I don't know how to say the last name. Sepulveda. 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 How's that? Pretty good? Uh, pray. Um, I pass my class. Okay. I passed my classes in this semester. Uh, okay. The rest of it's uh, private. Okay. So we'll uh, pray for Amanda. Uh, regarding uh, classes in sem uh, this semester, as well as uh, Margaret Best, who has a chest infection, and she was recently put on some uh, antibiotics. So uh, let's pray, and again, uh, any men who want to come forward here and just uh, uh, kneel at the altar, you're welcome to. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this time of uh, prayer. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we can come before your throne of grace and uh, Lord, that um, we know that you always uh, are available to hear from us. So Lord, we just thank you for this time. And uh, Lord, we do pray for Amanda as she's uh, uh, in this semester of her classes. We pray that you'd uh, help her, give her direction and strength and, uh, and help her to pass her classes. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just uh, um, give her the, the knowledge that she needs uh, to pass these classes and help her to do, do well. And then also we pray for Margaret Best, who is, um, has a chest infection. Lord, she uh, was put on some antibiotics. And uh, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'd be with uh, Margaret, that you'd give her uh, grace and peace. I pray, Lord, that the antibiotics uh, would do a, a work in helping her with the uh, chest infection. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just heal her and, and give her uh, uh, just uh, uh, strength as well as peace. And then, Lord, I just want to pray for a couple of uh, folks here, uh, one on the front of our bulletin. I do want to lift up, lift up the family of Terry Peterson. Uh, she went home to be with the Lord. 
And so, Lord, we do pray for the family of Terry. We pray that you would uh, just pour your grace out uh, on this family. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just give them peace. And I trust that many of them will have peace uh, knowing that Terry is in heaven. And, uh, Lord, I, I, I thank you for that, uh, the comfort that you do give uh, during th this difficult time. But I do pray, Lord, that you would uh, w be with the family and, again, uh, give them your grace, Lord, and, and peace and comfort. And uh, I pray, Lord, even through this uh, time that uh, maybe other family members or friends or loved ones would, that maybe haven't trusted Christ, I pray, Lord, that this would be an opportunity for them to hear the gospel. And, uh, Lord, they would hear the, the peace that uh, the family has. And I pray, Lord, that you would save souls through it. And then also we would lift up our brother Mike Scarpetti. I'm not sure if he's home yet from his trip, but I do uh, continue to lift him up uh, for recovery uh, regarding his health is issues, his back and his legs and what have you. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue to strengthen him and just heal him, Lord. And then just a couple of them in the, in the bulletin. I do want to lift up uh, uh, Mary Balo. Uh, Janice Komorowski has asked for this, uh, this woman uh, who has liver cancer. I pray, Lord, that you'd give strength to this person and that you'd uh, just uh, give a healing touch of your hand to this person as well. And I pray, Lord, that you'd uh, just, be, uh, uh, just be gracious with this person. And I pray if they're not saved, Lord, I pray they would get saved. And then also for uh, one last one, just for Tommy Moisick, who we've been praying for, uh, for his back pain. I know he's, it's going to be a, a kind of an enduring time for him because it seems to be a step at a time where he has to be diagnosed and be a medication and maybe whatever else takes place, whether it's therapy or surgery, I don't know. But, Lord, you know. And I just pray, Lord, that you'd uh, be with Tommy and give him strength and uh, give him peace, and I pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, be glorified through this, and I pray, Lord, that you would just heal him in a, in a miraculous way. Now, Lord, we do thank you for this time, and we pray uh, right now, too, for the master clubs that are going on, and for the, for the derby, the special event tonight. I pray that everything would go well, and Lord, I pray that uh, you be glorified through it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's power in the building, amen. Ushers, you can come on forward at this time. We're going to go ahead and collect this evening's tithes, offerings, and faith promise giving. And so, again, if you're just coming in uh, uh, this evening, uh, just a reminder that we do have a shortened service. We'll be heading upstairs at 730 to enjoy our children and the uh, Derby Pine Car there. Uh, just to, this reminder before we pray, Miss, uh, Miss Terry did pass away. That was announced Sunday. And the uh, funeral service for her is going to be this Friday at 10 o'clock here in the building. If you drive around the parking lot and you don't see any parking, we will be running a shuttle bus to Booth Park. To Booth Park. This is expected to be a large funeral. Uh, a lot of people are going to be here. You are encouraged to come. If you'd like to go to the wake, that's going to be at the Riverview Funeral Home this Thursday or tomorrow from 3 to 7. And I know Marcia and Bernice as well as all the rest of the family, would be very encouraged uh, by that. So keep that in mind, and uh, let's be an encouragement. Let's lift up our sister, sisters in Christ as they are grieving the loss of a loved one. Let's pray for this uh, evening's offering. Brother Jason, if you would, lead us in prayer. All right, Acts chapter 13 in your Bibles. Acts 13, we're marching through the book of Acts, and we're uh, 
looking at uh, a lot of exciting truths. Acts 13, once you've found that, if you would stand for the reading of God's Word. And we'll be looking at verses 48 and 49 there. To begin with, the Bible says, And when the Gentiles... How many of you here tonight are a Gentile? Raise your hand. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. All right. So this is um, talking about our forefathers. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. We're going to continue our study tonight of the commission of the church and the Christian. Lord, I ask tonight that you'd help us as we look at a passage that we ought to be very grateful for, Lord, a truth that we ought to be very grateful for, that the Messiah, the Messiah was not just for the Jews, even though he was a Jew, but Lord, he was meant for everybody. And here we are today in the United States of America, sitting in a building, worshiping our Savior, our Jewish Savior, as Gentiles. God, because to you there isn't a difference when it comes to the soul. Lord, how grateful we are for that. Lord, tonight, above all else, may we celebrate the fact that you love us. May you celebrate the, may we celebrate the fact that you saved us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. We began the study uh, several weeks ago and, and, and looked at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. We said that uh, the book is divided geographically by that very verse. We said that Jerusalem, the evangelism, the preaching of the gospel in Jerusalem uh, is covered in chapters 2 through 7. Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 through 12 and then 13 through 28 shows that of the uttermost, the Two weeks of the study that we've gotten through so far, we've talked about how that Jerusalem was evangelized, and then we looked at how Judea and Samaria was evangelized. Now, if you remember back uh, to uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how that persecution brought down the racial divide. I believe that was last Wednesday, right? There was this racism from the Jerusalem church toward everybody else that ran deep. It ran uh, uh, deep with family roots. It ran deep because of um, uh, culture and uh, societal teachings. And the Jews did not want to have anything to do with the, the Samaritans. And so God sent persecution to that Jerusalem church and they scattered. Well, where did they scatter? They scattered out of Jerusalem and they scattered into the rest of Judea, and they scattered into Samaria. And here you had this revival break out. Well, uh, they realized quickly, and we ended the message last week talking about the establishment of the church of Antioch, how that, that was established. That was the first multi-culture church found in the Bible. And so now they have ventured out as far as Samaria and Judea. But what about the rest? What about the uttermost. I believe that maybe some of the leaders of this Antioch church thought back to the time they stood there with Jesus at the Mount of Olives and he said, you need to go to Jerusalem. And they got out their checklist and they said, check. And they said, yeah, you got to go to Judea and Samaria. And they said, okay, well, through some persecution we got there, but check. And they thought, we're not quite done with the checklist here. We still need to go to the uttermost. We need to go to the uttermost. And uh, there was some great hesitation there. You see, it was a big step to go to a half-Jew Gentile. But to go to a full Gentile and to give the gospel to a full Gentile, oh, that was a whole other step. And I believe there were some men in the church who said, listen, if we don't learn from history, we're going to be punished because we didn't learn from history. We better go send people to the uttermost before persecution comes and drives us to the uttermost, and so uh, that's what it did. So we, uh, that's a quick uh, synopsis recap of the first six points there. Let's jump right in, and we'll see how far we can get. We're going to knock it off right at 7.30. It's about 15 minutes from now. Number seven, notice the placement of holy hands. The placement of holy hands. Now, uh, uh, this idea of placing your hands on somebody, uh, praying over somebody, 
while that might sound mystical and strange, it is a very, very biblical concept. In fact, and it wasn't just a biblical concept for back uh, in the Bible. We're going to see some powerful times of laying on of hands. But I'll tell you tonight that even in today's uh, uh, dispensation or era, there is still the placement of holy hands that makes a great difference, that makes a great impact uh, on people. Let me be clear on that is that there's nothing magical about the hands, but there is something special about God working through a man or, or men who are submitted and humble and free of sin, praying God's grace down on uh, someone else. And uh, I believe it's Jude that talks about, or James, rather James that talks about the, the, the uh, pouring out of oil and uh, over the sick and the laying on of hands. And so this practice took place. But again, the emphasis tonight is the gospel going from Judea out to the uttermost. And we see, first of all, the first sub point there is on the Gentiles. Letter A, on the Gentiles. Turn back over to chapter number 8 chapter number 8, look at verse number 14. And we're going to look first at the, uh, those in the Samaria area. Their hands were laid on them. And look what happened there in chapter 8 in verse number 14. The Bible says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, just a reminder, the Samaritans were half Assyrian or half Gentile and half Jew. Okay, They sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands, laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So we know about the Holy Ghost coming down on those in the upper room, right? We talked about that in the very first week of the study. There was the pillar of fire, there was there the tongues of fire, uh, uh, Acts 1 talks about, or Acts 2 talks about, there was the, uh, the, the rushing mighty wind, we talked about how that was God endorsing the new temple, the New Testament temple of the body of the believer, but as you see the gospel go from the, the apostles into Jerusalem and then on out into Judea, there needs to be this uh, th this breaking of a barrier of the Holy Spirit entering these believers. And so these folks had been baptized in Jesus' name, but they had not yet received the Holy Ghost. And so Peter and John come and they lay their hands on them and they pray, and the Holy Spirit enters them. And so immediately I'm going to be asked, or, or the question might come to mind, well, is that how it works today? And the answer is no. This was an inaugural thing per people group, and once that happened to that people group at that inaugural time, everybody behind that believed on Jesus and they were saved, or, or rather they received the Holy Ghost upon their salvation. Flip over with me to chapter 10, and we find the story of Cornelius. Now we referenced this last week, uh, Cornelius, but you'll see the same thing here is that Cornelius believes earlier in the chapter, but it's later in the chapter that the Holy Ghost falls on him, and he actually behaves the same way that they did there in Acts 2 in the upper room. Look at 44, the Bible says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Now, P uh, uh, Cornelius is a full-blown Gentile, okay? So this is not uh, a, a Jew, this is not half Jew, half Gentile, this is a full-blown Gentile. 45, And they of the circumcision, or the Jews, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that uh, these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So we see the placement of holy hands. Holy hands are being laid, and the Holy Spirit is beginning that inaugural entering of that people group. Now, how many of you here today are born again? All right. How many of you here today know what it means to have the Holy Spirit convict you when you sin? Would you raise your hand? Did anybody lay hands on you and pray that you receive the Holy Spirit? Do you know why? Because that only needed to happen that, that initial time. And so the Gentiles had this happen with Cornelius, and every single Gentile after that that believed, the Holy Spirit just entered them naturally. So the placement of holy hands, and again, the emphasis tonight is the gospel 
to the Gentiles. So the placement of holy hands on the Gentiles. How about the placement of holy hands for the Gentiles? Turn over to chapter 13 and look at verse number 1. This church of Antioch is up, it's big, it's growing, and it's powerful. Uh, Their testimony is strong. In fact, people from outside the church, we read in the book of Acts, I think chapter 12, begin to look at the people in this church and say, hey, you all are little miniature versions of Christ, and that hence the name Christian. You all are Christians. They were called that first at Antioch. And so this church of Antioch says, hey, look, we've got to continue the great commission into the uttermost. Look at verse number one. Now there was chapter 13, verse one. Now there was in the church uh, that was at Antioch uh, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and uh, uh, Manna, Manna in which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Where did they go? Well, you read on down. They sent them away on that inaugural missionary journey, a journey into Gentile land into Asia, Asia Minor. Most of their travels would have been in modern-day Turkey. And so uh, they go on three missionary journeys. And Paul, uh, here Saul, but would be called Paul, uh, would, would be called the Apostle to the Gentiles. The Apostle to the Gentiles. The truth is, almost all of us here today can trace our Christian heritage back to one of two people. Either to the Ethiopian eunuch or to the Apostle Paul. Most of us can track our Christian heritage back to one of those two people. I am so glad that God called Paul and had him commissioned to go. Now, if you see here the pattern, they didn't just pull two names out of a hat. They fasted, they prayed, they sought the Lord, they cleared the emotional clutter, they cleared the societal noise, they, they pushed away uh, the carnal opinions around them, and they sought God's face as to who to send to the Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit led a group of men that it should be Barnabas and Paul. I think it's a great people pairing. How many of you here that are married have noticed that you are quite different in personality than your wife? Anybody here ever noticed that? You know why? God brought that woman along, that man along to complete you. And so your personality differences, when you get strife and selfishness out of the way, that, that's a big thing. You've got to get strife and, strife and selfishness out. You two become a complete person. Well, you look at Paul and Barnabas and you study their personalities in Scripture, they were two opposites. Man, Barnabas had a heart that was as big as, 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 big as the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, he, he wanted to give everybody a second chance. He wanted to love. The guy sold all of his belongings and gave his money to the poor and said, God, I just trust you. Barnabas, man, he was, he was just personable and lovable. And Paul, he was the firecracker. You read in the scripture, he was, I mean, he, he, he loved, but, but he, he had to be reminded to speak the truth in love, right? He was the one that withstood Peter to the face and had no issue doing it. He was, uh, when, when John Mark blew it, you remember in, in the book of Acts, John Mark blew it and left and went home early. And uh, they were going to go out a second time. And man, uh, Barnabas wanted to open up his heart. Let's give him another chance. Paul's like, nope, he blew it. He slowed us down once. He's not doing it again. Yeah, that was his attitude. So you have the firecracker firm Paul and you've got the soft hearted, lovable Barnabas. And God had them paired for at least that first journey so that they could go and be that complete team of, of, of loving the Gentiles and getting that started. God had these two men selected, and the two of them would go and see many, many, many churches planted in the Gentile world. So the placement of holy hands. Notice next the priority of the gospel presentation. The priority of the gospel presentation. Turn over to chapter 13 with me and look at uh, verse number 5. And l- let's see here, as they enter a Gentile city. Jews live in all these Gentile cities. Look here at their priority as soon as they enter. Look at verse number 5. It says, And when they were at uh, 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 Salamis, they preached the word of God. Look here. 
in the synagogue of the Jews. That was the first place they went. And they had also uh, John uh, to their minister. Now, look down with me at verse number 14. They're going to go to another city. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. This is another Antioch. And went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Now, the synagogue was for the Jews. This was a Judaism religion. They went first, before they talked to a single Gentile, they went first to the Jews. You can put that first uh, sub-point up there for me. The Jews first. All right, look down at verse number 42. Chapter 13, verse number 42. The Bible says, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought them these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So the Gentiles want the gospel, but, but Paul and Barnabas and their team take it to the Jews first. So they're going in the synagogues, and they're preaching about the Jewish Messiah to the Jews first. They didn't set up shop outside the synagogue. And listen, I believe that Paul knew, especially after a couple of times of this, that he was going to get rejected. These were the same people of the same religion that had just crucified Jesus a few years prior. He knew that that message was most likely going to be rejected, but he had an obligation to take the message of the Jewish uh, Messiah to the Jews first. Notice that uh, next sub-point there, the Gentiles second, the Gentiles second. So after they've gone to the Jews and the Jews have rejected the truth, then they go to the Gentiles. Look at uh, verse 44 of chapter 13. The Bible says, in the, in the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. These are the Gentiles, all right? Here we are, uh, uh, let's see, uh, verse 42 tells us where they were. Uh, what city are they in here? I lost my spot. I'm sorry, verse, uh, so verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Sound familiar? And spake against those things that were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. Probably Paul waxed bold. Barnabas was in the background. And said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have sent thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So now he's quoting the Old Testament, verse 48, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believe. So the very first thing, they go to the, the Jews. The Jews reject, they go to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are hungry for the gospel. You're talking about a field that's white, white under harvest. The Gentiles flock in. The crowds are huge. They're preaching the gospel. People are getting saved. And then the Jews begin to become envious. And they begin to sow discord among. And Paul withstands them. And this would be a pattern every single place that Paul and his partner a uh, gospel preaching partner would go. Turn over with me to Romans chapter 2 and verse number 10. We'll be in uh, Romans here uh, soon, but Romans chapter 2 and verse number 10. We'll finish with this verse here. Again, Paul wrote the book of Romans but uh, through the inspiration of God. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. You find that phrase, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile or Greek, three times just in the book of Romans. The idea here is that the gospel was to go to the Jew first. And you'd say, well, why was that? Well, uh, God chose the Jews to be His people, and they're still His chosen people. In the end, G Jesus is going to set up His throne in Jerusalem as a Jewish king, and He's going to rule the entire world from there. At that moment, Jews and Gentiles will intermingle and mix, but it will still be a Jewish-centric kingdom. And uh, that was God's uh, heart was to see the message taken there. But I just have to say that I am thankful to my God that he saves the Gentiles. Amen. Aren't you glad for that tonight? You say, Pastor, what can we take away from the Bible study tonight? That regardless of your color, creed, regardless of your socioeconomic uh, class, regardless of any of that, Jesus loves you just the same and he wants to save your soul. And if Jesus can treat people that way, then we should be willing to do the same thing. Amen? Amen. Next week we'll finish up the book of Acts. And uh, chapter 21 through 28 is just about Paul's journey from, uh, from Jerusalem to Rome and, to, and, and on to the time of his death. But we'll finish it up next week. Excited for that. Uh, one quick note before we head upstairs.
the, uh, uh, one of the newest families to join our church, uh, uh, Lenny and Jennifer, they, uh, they are working to start their own pizza restaurant, pizza company, and they have a wood, uh, see, a brick oven grill upstairs. They're going to be making pizzas for sell. 12 inch pizza, I believe they're selling for 10 bucks. So uh, if you could be a blessing to them and a blessing to yourself, buy that up. They're going to have three or four different types of pizzas and buy that up and, uh, and, and enjoy that while you're watching the race. So that will be being sold. They're set up outside. You'll, you'll buy those actually in the hallway, uh, back in the back hallway by the kitchen. So uh, be involved in that if you can and be a blessing to them. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed for a word of prayer tonight. And encourage all of you that can to stick around and head upstairs. Just a quick word about the race. Let's be Christians. If your child doesn't win, don't pitch, a, don't pitch a fit. And if your child wins, win gracefully. Amen? All right. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the Bible study. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for not excluding us from your great plan. And Lord, I can't wait to stand in heaven, Jew and Gentile together, and sing your praises for all of eternity, to behold your perfection. What a glorious, glorious time that will be. Until that day, help us to live our lives with the Holy Spirit in charge. Help us to live our lives believing and trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, God bless you. We'll see you upstairs.